and across the board that many of the rules, regulations, and other things that the strategy reinforces um, are not well known by the public. Um, and maybe in some ways, the, the strategy for educating uh, currently is ineffective. Mm. Um, and, and, and what the, the means for that education, uh, it could be many fold. Uh, it can be online and can be in the field and I'm not ready to prescribe any strategies. I just want to make sure that we all agree on sort of what might be a top level sort of concern. Um, I want to rotate now through the hands and I think I saw Dave's first um, and then I, I'm going to need facilitation support to keep yeah, track of the others. Dave, Dick, and then Dave again. Thank you. Yeah, Walter, you hit it on the head and so did Charlie there. I think we all agree. Um, there's existing rules that maybe we, the state doesn't have capacity to educate people on or enforce. Um, and so I think that is the main gist of almost all the proposals. And so that's where I'd like to focus is on how we can make a recommendation that um, makes both of those things uh, more efficient and, and hopefully um, better funded so that they can do the work that needs to be done. And some of these proposals maybe um, wouldn't need to come to this group if, if that was the case. So that's what I'm really looking forward to addressing. Uh, Dick Vanderschaff, you're next. And then I see Tom and Scott f uh, following Dick and Dave Fox. Yeah, uh, thanks, Andy. And I think just to follow on with what uh, Dave Lacey noted, I think that the reason people maybe um, continue to express these concerns about, say, wildlife harassment and other issues that we that have been raised throughout this process is that they, they continue to see these, these things occurring um, and they don't see that there's enough agency support to, to actually um, to uh, enforce compliance and that, not that I hate, and I hate to use that word enforce, but to, to do that work. And so I think that that's where people are misunderstanding that maybe these, these regulations are either um, not here, not present and certainly not, not in effect. And again, as Dave noted, um, it's really coming down to there is insufficient um, uh, capacity within agencies. And I think that's as, Tom Calvinese mentioned yesterday, it's, it continues to be the elephant in the room that I think we need to look for ways to address. And, and uh, since I have the soapbox, I'll go for one more minute just to mention that we, we placed an awful lot of reliance and talk about um, volunteer action, which is wonderful. The state of Oregon steps up all the time for these things, but there are places where volunteers can't do the work of an agency. And there's many reasons around that. Um, and I've learned that myself being in an NGO where we oftentimes want to do out of the goodness of our missions and things to do these works. But if we step in too many times as volunteers or as NGOs to do the work of an agency, the agencies sometimes could have the lose, lose their own um, um, interest in doing this work that they are mandated. So I think it really, it does come down to, we need to, as, as the working group, make a recommendation that um, agencies um, should have the capacity to, um, assist with this work and to actually direct it in terms of managing these these uh, habitats that we've learned are more and more important as as years go by. So I'll stop on my soapbox right there, but just to say that again, that I think we we certainly need to um, realize that that people's um, not understanding that these these regulations are currently there is because they're still seeing these infractions and and issues uh, occurring on these lands. Um. Okay, so I just want to call attention that Dave and Dick have both kind of brought up another thing, um, which is uh, the why. Um, and I, I, I'm trying to compartmentalize here um, concerns and solutions, um, but uh, there has been offered a why um, by both Walter and by Dick and Dave now. Um, Walter in the camp of the public not understanding. Um, and I heard from Dick and Dave um, also agree with that, but also said that they felt like the agencies, uh, state agencies and volunteer groups collectively um, do not have the capacity uh, to enforce uh, or implement those strategies. 
Um, I just want to make sure that we're we're compartmentalizing those things and that those are captured in this discussion um, as as a solution to a problem or the why um, uh, before we get too far. I'm happy to, to have those discussions and I'm glad this is being brought up, but I just want to make sure for the decision making process that we're going to have to enter into at some point or the recommendation that um, we're finding consensus on the problems and the, the solutions as well. So I'll stop there and let's go to who's next, Dave or Tom? Uh, Dave Fox and then Tom and Scott. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, let's see, to how to, I, was, I was listening intently to the last couple, so it, it, uh, it kind of threw me off thinking what I was going to say. Um, uh, just a couple of things. Um, there's, you know, I, I definitely agree there's a misunderstanding of, uh, or maybe lack of, of knowledge of, um, you know, which regulations are there now. Um, but there's also this other lack of knowledge where I think there's a lot of people that think there are regulations present where there actually aren't. And, um, uh, you know, a good example is that, you know, the Haystack Rock, um, folks, you know, a lot of the, you know, looking at some brochures that came out and, and, you know, listening to some people talk, there's a lot of people that, you know, truly believe there is a 500 foot buffer around Haystack Rock. Um, you know, they truly believe there's, you know, no trampling or some, you know, other types of regulations for that area when they're in fact they're not. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the misunderstanding kind of goes both ways that, you know, not realizing what regulations are there and also, incorrectly thinking there are some regulations that actually don't exist. Um, and I think, um, you know, one, one problem or, or, or <laughs> Charlie wants solutions, so I'll, I'll, I'll offer another problem. Um, the, the management of Rocky Shores is really kind of a, you know, very dispersed, spread out, non-centralized, you know, management of different agencies doing little bits of different things and so it, it it's actually quite quite difficult to, to uh explain all that and you know unless someone's really interested in you know like a law student or something you know someone is really interested in learning the super detailed nuances of all these kind of overlapping and you know complementary regulations it's it's a tough thing to to explain and really get the, the full understanding. So there's, that's a challenge, I think, of explaining regulations and explaining how, you know, the current management works. Um, you know, another piece of this puzzle, and maybe this is another compartmentalized thing, is that, you know, what we're hearing from the public in these sites is, you know, it seems like the main concern is, you um, is wildlife disturbance. It's not, you know, harvest. It's, you know, not not other things. It's really, you know, wildlife, primarily birds and marine mammals, uh, disturbance. And um, even though there are existing regulations on that, um, there, you know, obviously they're not they're not fully enforced because that would be, you know, you, you would need this whole army of people out there, you know, all the time to enforce that. But also it's a type of thing where the vast majority of people aren't disturbing wildlife on purpose. They don't, no one, I, there's very few people that want to disturb and harm wildlife. So it's really all unintentional or most of it, 99% unintentional accidental things. And it, regulating and trying to enforce these accidental things is, you know, it's not always the best way to go. You know, you, you don't want to come down hard on people that are doing things completely unintentional. Um, and that's where, you know, and, and I think we all recognize that that's where education and volunteer programs and docent programs and things like that come in. So rather than focusing on let's write a new regulation and get, you know, fund a big police force to stand around at the site, you know, it's better to and then and then ticket people who who totally unintentionally are, you know, accidentally doing things. Um, it's better to have, you know, the docents talking with people and, you know, it's not going to solve 100 percent of it but but if we're if we're looking for 100 percent compliance we're not we're going to fail we're never going to get 100 percent you know so if we could just increase it from you know maybe there's 100 disturbances a year and you cut it down to 40 that's that's a huge change 
you know, and, and, and those are the types of things I think we should be shooting for. And that's where the, you know, where the education and, and docent programs and, you know, those types of things come in. Anyway, I'm probably just saying what, what we all already know, but um, I'll, I'll stop at that. Thanks. So I just want to make sure I heard things correctly. I think Dave revisited a lot of things we've discussed, but I, I, I want to go back to problems and solutions. And, and really, we're highlighting problems right now, not necessarily the solutions. But I hear um, problem number one, there's a lack of education um, for the public. That, that education goes both ways, um, both what laws exist, both which laws um, maybe don't exist that they think exists. Um, problem number two, there's a lack of capacity to implement the strategy, whether that be education or enforcement. Um, there seems to be a lack of capacity. There may be disagreement where that capacity should be um, and how it should be funded, but I think, I think we have agreement there. Um, and, and number three, I think one of the biggest problems that Dave highlighted again um, is that the, the, that we're hearing is wildlife disturbance if we really wanted to get down to the management thing. Um, and I think that's something that Dave probably can wrap his head around because that's his job, uh, natural resources. Um, but uh, yeah, wildlife disturbance. Would anybody disagree with any of the things that I just said are kind of thematic problems that we've identified um, and please don't project the solution. I just want to just get at, do we agree? Would we all agree that these are kind of the, the problems? Um, and and I'm, I'm, we'll go down the line here, here from Scott and Tom uh, and Walter for more, but I want to make sure that I'm, I'm capturing them all correctly. Any disagreement on that? Those three kind of things that we just... I don't disagree, but I think there's some nuances and I'd There's like a lot of nuances. Those. There's nuances we can spend many meetings talking about. I just want to, I'm trying to find the themes right now. So I just, um, and I, we can get into those nuances. I'm just trying to find agreement where we can before we jump into the nuances. Okay, I'm not seeing any disagreement. So let's go on. Uh, was it Scott that's next or, or Tom? Tom, Scott, and then Walter. Yeah, so I'll, I won't go on for many meetings, but I do want to talk about some of the nuances. I think, first, I think, uh, I you know generally agree, I think we've, we've been all talking about this for long enough that I don't think there's any major disagreements on the themes, whether it's education, capacity, enforcement, etc. I do want to get into a few nuances, though, because I think it's a mistake to draw a sharp distinction between enforcement and education. And, you know, when we say things like, you know, policing, I don't think enforcement is a wise strategy with most of most problems in life, <laughs> I think are better uh, resolved through education. And I don't think that it's a, the agencies are not so solely tasked with enforcement. Um, otherwise, you would not have rangers doing interpretation. Um, you know, state state staff or federal staff doing interpretation, which they do. Um, so I just want to draw that distinction and, and think outside of that that uh, differentiation because I think that you can do both, um, and doing one actually helps you do the other. So a um, couple of things I want to say as far as capacity building, I think that applies across the board. Uh, I think it's, uh, the th to me, one of the major takeaways from this whole process, from ours, from the public process, from the site proposals to all the way up to now, is that it has been made abundantly clear that the agencies that are tasked with, the, with managing these resources do not have the capacity to properly do that. And I think that that's just something we, we can't escape that and we really have to, I feel we have to make a strong statement about that and about that being an, a really important piece of the puzzle. And I think it's broad. I don't think it's just parks, it's Fish and Wildlife, maybe ODF W2, but I agree with Dave uh, Fox and that much of what we heard was about wildlife disturbance. 
So I don't know where the line is there between ODFW and US Fish and Wildlife Service, but we could sort that out later. Um, and then in terms of capacity building, I think we also need to look to the tribal nations, many of which also do not have the capacity they need to uh, engage in these issues in a meaningful way. And I don't, I don't think it's fair to, you know, we've done a good job of inclus inclusion in our process, but I don't think we've done a good job of acknowledging their need for capacity building. And then of course, all of the community groups that, um, you know, have come to us because we kind of asked them to come to us to promise things that in many cases, they don't have the current capacity to deliver. So, you know, that's just the reality. I think we just need to face that. And I think there's also an equity concern here having to do with, um, you know, I think it's great to have the have volunteer programs. I'm all for it, but I'm living in a community where a lot of people cannot afford to volunteer. And we need to start thinking in terms of job creation. And I think it's important to be bold here and say, you know, why can't we promote the idea of building capacity within our agencies that includes some job training for some young people to get into a, you know, a young ranger kind of program with interpretation uh, capabilities, or even just some of the stuff we, that came up when we were talking about a site like Crook Point, um, like what Sean was saying, and, you know, for, correct me if I'm wrong in any of this, Sean, but, you know, like if, if what's really needed there is not so much an interpretation program, but somebody who goes and checks to make sure the signs are up and sort of is uh, stationed there at certain times of year to just, you know, let people know, you know, where is good to go and where isn't, um, things like that. And I think all of this uh, also needs coordination. I think we hear that loud and clear, having some level of coordination function built into this idea, this concept. And of course, uh, things that we've already called out in terms of data collection and education, community science, uh, really meshing with research uh, out of uh, institutions. So I, 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 know it's, I know it's rough to sort of pitch a big visionary kind of concept like this. And I threw this idea of the Coastal Conservation Corps idea out there for a reason, because I feel like it's important to kind of focus our minds on a vision of what we would love to see that, that re reaches into all of these areas that I don't think any one of them is the solution, but we have to think more comprehensively and holistically, which I think we have. Uh, but somehow, could, if we could convey this sort of vision that says, yeah, all of these things can, can be part of a more comprehensive approach to the managing of rocky habitat on the Oregon coast. I don't know, maybe that's at least a place to start. And there may be specific initiatives within that that could be rolled out or promoted by OPAC or approved or advocated for, or, and some go elsewhere. But um, anyway, I'll stop there. I, I think you guys get the picture and I appreciate the time and uh, agree with where we're headed. So, Tom said a lot and went a lot of places. This conservation core concept for the, I, I prefer to maybe not use that language if we can and say that that's what we're doing. The strategy is a unified thing. What we're talking about right now is the unified approach. It's not site-based proposals. Um, I, 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 I appreciate that you have a name for that vision. Um, I, I think we, as in this group, need to think just rather than branding right now about what the vision is. And I think that's where we're at. I think you raise really important and good points around capacity, around looking at those as opportunities, um, not just for you know the limitations, but also potentially workforce potential and otherwise. Um, I don't wanna revisit that we all agree that um, policing, so if we cannot use that word to, to spark new conversations, um, I think we all agree that that's not the right approach. Uh, uh, Laurel rightly put in the, 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 the chat there that we always strive for compliance. That's the word you'll hear agencies use, compliance over enforcement. Um, I'm going to ask folks to try and not pull up and jump into hot button issues like that that might take us down the thing that I think we all already agree on. Um, but I think you did raise really important points about capacity and the unified vision um, that we're really trying to get out of this. Um, so 
let's just avoid the word enforcement and policing. Um, and, and this, what we're talking about is compliance uh, for the strategy. Thanks. Scott, I think you're next and then Walter. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't try to take on the role of a heretic, but it seems like I always end up in that spot. And so I apologize in advance for that, but um, uh, I guess I have followed this process for quite some time now. I try to get to Rocky Shores when I can. Um, and admittedly, when I go to Rocky Shores, I uh, try to intentionally seek out the ones that aren't at the super busy places. I wouldn't uh, normally go to a place like Haystack Rock. I would go to uh, probably a place like Blacklock if I if it were nearby. But um, from my observation, uh, we talk a lot about all these increasing impacts, but I don't see any data. I haven't, and maybe it's there, maybe, uh, you know, uh, maybe Sean's uh, organization has some good data on uh, what is actually happening, or Laurel may have some, but uh, it's always, a, a lot of the proposals just sort of had this assumption, or it was stated as, uh, you know, we, we have increasing visitorship. That's true. I know during the pandemic, we saw a lot more people coming to the coast, uh, certainly to the parks. Whether that really translates into more people on rocky habitat, uh, I don't know. I, I, I would assume that probably last year we did have an increase, but um, how much of that is actually trampling and how much is disturbing birds? I, I guess there's, I just haven't seen anybody present any data to say, here's what we find. Here's the, at this site, we had so many birds flee their nest because of disturbance in a, you know, in a two hour time frame, we, we observed uh, so many birds be flushed from their nest. And so I, I just, I guess I have to say, I would like to see this based on some real data rather than just sort of this idea that, well, we all know that there's more visitors and we all know that uh, the problem is worse now. I think if you look back historically, um, there was a lot of things that were done in our uh, not too distant past that are way worse than what is going on now. It's not justification, but uh, I can remember reading that some of the offshore rocks uh, down in Tillamook County, uh, boats used to come by and, uh, and people would practice shooting the birds. That was their, that was a recreation activity uh, shooting birds on one of the rocks, I think it was right around Cape Mears. So um, certainly we're, we're glad that doesn't occur anymore. But uh, do we have data that's really uh, concretely showing that the disturbance is increasing uh, over time or that um, the trampling is worse now than it was uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or 30 years ago? Just a question. Uh, I think I could partially answer that question. I would leave it to the experts. Um, we did hear a lot in the proposals. Um, there was pretty site-specific documented um, uh, metrics that came from the proposers. I don't know that everybody bought into or believed all of those. Um, and I think that that was where um, there was some concern. Scott, if you'll look at the slide in front of us now, though, one of the things we really, and to that point, was trying to get at some metrics um, so that um, we can start to measure these things, realizing that um, if the data is not there, then we should be collecting that information. Would you, would you support a program that kind of looked at um, and sort of evaluated, started to begin to develop those metrics so that you would have the data um, to make decisions in the future about uh, the resources? Uh, I, I believe that there probably is uh, the ability to collect that data. And I, I'm, I think that's great if it can be done. It sounds like uh, Sean and the 
in uh, his uh, chat had indicated that they have data. Uh, so um, I guess I'm, you know, to the bigger picture of today, I'm, I'm uh, not so sure that we need to create a new program. Uh, I'd like to see this stu stuff done voluntarily uh, or within the current capacity, uh, but uh, um, I, I need to be shown the case to, to build a new program. So do you believe that there should be support for the data? You don't believe that there should be any support for the data collection. And, and that's what I'm trying to understand is like to get us to data collection in that formalized program, there would have to be support, but you think that needs to come from the existing capacity or volunteers? Uh, I, that's what I'd prefer, Charlie. Okay. That's what I prefer. So I think uh, Walter, Tom, you still have your hand up and then I have a comment. Yeah, I just saw the two comments that Sean put up and, you know, kind of, I, when we're talking about compliance, I, I, would, I wouldn't even say, um, I would use the word lack of knowledge or awareness for many of the visitors to the Oregon coast ab about these things. Um, the reason I brought this up is because when I saw in a lot of the proposals, they want to stop something or protect something. And um, to, to Tom's point about enforcement, be careful what you wish for. When you say you want to protect something or stop something, you, 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 that might be your intention, but what you get out of wanting that might be entirely different than what you assume. Um, you know, I, I'm, my wife works for Fish and Wildlife Service. I've been around Fish and Wildlife Service refuges since I was a, a young, a, a teenager. Um, they're the only agency that is set up to actually protect the habitat. And the way they do that is they keep people out of there. And that, that's been my concern about uh, some of these proposals. They want to protect something and they want to stop something. And if they're saying that people are the, are the cause, that could lead to people being restricted from that area. And it's just devil in the details. And that's one of my main concerns because that will allow, if you wanna stop something from happening and if people are assumed to be the cause, that means no people there. And that's not what we want. So we have to come up with a way to find if that if people are the, if the problem to educate these people to know that what they're doing might cause the problem that people are seeing here. Um, because if you, if there becomes a, a campaign to stop all these things that other people are seeing as far as disturbance and harassment, it, it could lead to a lot of different, a lot of things that people don't want to see. Um, and, and I'll just leave it there. Um, that, that's been my concern when, that, that there could be an unintended, unintended consequences to what people want what the proposers want to see as far as stopping something from happening. So um, sorry for droning on. No, Walter, I just want to make sure I heard your concern correctly. And so I think your concern is um, loss of access and over protecting um, uh, uh, based on um, what is that based on the wildlife metrics? Is that coming no, off? No, of that? no. If someone wants it, these are the proposers want to protect something and stop things from happening. And, that, and their ideas of stopping it might not work. And if their entire goal, if the, if the goal is to stop something from happening, that, that could lead to loss of public access. Yeah, and so I think what I wanna make sure we're talking about is the, the, what we're really talking about is minimizing of public, of, of wildlife disturbance. Right. There's a concern there that in the minimizing of wildlife disturbance, it could go too far. Um, yeah and it could result in a loss of access entirely. And, and is that, did I hear you correctly? Yeah, and, and some of the goals of these proposals were to stop harassment and to stop um, disturbance. And that- and I think, Yeah, and I think it's the job of the state agencies and this working group in OPAC to understand that nothing can stop completely and we can yeah. do the best we can. I thought Dave's example going from 100 disturbances to 40 was actually a good one. Mm -hmm. um, but good point and something the working group needs to keep in mind as well as OPAC and, and how we would approach 
um, potential solutions for these things. Well, and, and to go back to Sean's comments too, um, you know, <clears throat> since we've been here in, in Newport for you know 20 years now, the, the Mer colony has basically failed out there in Nequina Head. And it turned out it was because of the return of the, the bald eagles. And so other than looking at, you know, all of a sudden the, 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 the birds disappear and then, you know, what's happening? Well, it was, a nat it was a natural occurrence. And so we need to make sure that what we're seeing isn't, is caused, find out what the causes are. Kind of like getting back to what Scott said and what Sean said is that a lot of these disturbances and harassments are done by predators and we, we can't stop that. So that, that's all. Tom? So Walter was just clearly, I think, stating that there's there's other disturbances, some natural, some many that we can't control, and then also that there's limitations to the ability of us minimizing disturbances, um, and that those limitations, if overreached, could um, potentially create a whole loss of access um, together. I think, I don't know if it was Tom or Andy that was next. It's Tom, I believe. Tom. Uh, yeah, I guess I left my hand up, but I'll just uh, pick up on what Walter was just saying. I agree. And uh, sort of this walking this line between having enough information to know what the actual cause is, accepting the fact that there's things we can't control. And then again, I think just going back to building capacity doesn't necessarily have to be a new program. Uh, I think what we have in place can work, clearly is working. I think Laurel, uh, alluded to that in her earlier comment, and I agree. And again, I just think, uh, once again, the, the biggest challenge looks to me like a lack of capacity to do more of that good work. And I think there's lots of ways to enhance that. Uh, but again, I'll just keep coming back to the equity question and uh, the need to, um, I think, develop some job creation around this. Uh, that can complement volunteer programs. So volunteer programs are not on their own, they're, they're adequately supported. And the agencies that have that responsibility have the tools they need to, to, uh, you know, to carry it out. That's it. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Andy? Yeah, thanks. Um, I wanted to speak to the idea of data-driven decisions. Um, as a part of supporting this working group and the revisions to the territorial sea plan, we spent a lot of time and effort to try and gather information that could inform us about the status and trends in our nearshore rocky intertidal ecosystems. And we struggled mightily with that task. There is a hodgepodge of sites that we have observations on. Um, and we have some very specific focused efforts associated with monitoring some of the more, I'm going to call them easy to observe uh, natural features. Uh, you know, bird colonies are one of those. You can, you can fly over them and see them clearly. Um, but a lot of the things that we uh, would like to be able to make data-driven dri decisions on, like kelp beds, macroalgae in the near shore, we really struggled. Um, we, we had some successes. We created the first intertidal substrate habitat map the state has ever had as a part of this process. And, and we now have that the ability to use that, that first version of the product to better understand the makeup of the intertidal associated with each of our rocky sites and with the proposed areas. Um, but we have not built a decision-making framework about percentages of, of different kinds of substrate that may fall into some kind of a protected status or another. We didn't have that capability when we started. We potentially could have that capability in the future because of that product. But that product was created through a very small grant program uh, within the state, uh, $50,000 to generate that. Um, but that is just the first small step in trying to understand, you know, the status and trends in, in the system. And, and so I'll just say that's one example of a place where our state 
could use some additional capacity to better understand these systems. Uh, I'm gonna switch dramatically from observations of our natural resources to observations of our natural resource agencies. The first of which is that you know, we have at DLCD 30% of one FTE that's devoted to supporting OPAC. Uh, it, as a part of this process, we were able to secure a full-time Rocky Habitat coordinator, but that funding was associated with that one grant. So as we envision and think about supporting the next process, we do need to think about bringing back that capacity because you know, we, we've had challenges in developing the process and, and working all along, but we have not uh, secured a Rocky Habitat coordinator who can help us do the things that we've talked about doing. And 30% of my time isn't gonna cut it for the next go around in this process. Um, hopefully we'll have a, a look, kind of a, the formulaic process laid out so that we don't have to do a lot of the kind of determinations about what that's going to be. But, you know, really this, the state as, as a whole, you know, funds OPAC through federal dollars from NOAA at less than 30% of one FTE. So that is, in my view, a weakness of our state's investment in OPAC. And, and I believe that that is a point that, that we could talk about. So I'll, I'll stop there. I think that those are a couple examples of really where I see major gaps between where we wanna go and where we are. Thanks, Andy. Um, I think Walter's hand might have been up next. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to take a deep breath here. Um, you know, in my other life, and I know you are also, Tom. We're also commissioners for our for our ports here. Um, and I, Andy, I sympathize with you, but um, I, you know, I'm going to just say, right, wel welcome to the coast of Oregon. Um, Mm -hmm. My budget for the post for the coast, and as a coastal port, is very small. We serve a lot of people from the valley, and with working with my county commissioners and other city um, officials in, around the Newport area, our problem isn't um, the willingness to do something. It's a lack of funding, and that goes to the state level. Um, I see this as a problem with Salem. Uh, if they're not willing to devote resources to the rural communities, such as the coast, this is always going to be a problem. Um, I, I'm not going to get into politics any farther than that, but this is not just an agency problem. It's a, it's a problem in Salem that they don't see the value of the coastal area and the other rural areas of Oregon. They choose to focus their attention on the I-5 corridor. And until we stop, turn, turn that around, we're not gonna get funding out here. Um, there, I'm, without getting further into politics, I think that that's, if anything, that OPAC could tell the governor's office is that they need to stop focusing. They, if they want to protect these areas, they want management of these areas, they need to funnel some of that money that they put into the rural, uh, into the urban areas of or Oregon and put them to the coast. So I'll, I will just leave it at that without making a fool of myself. Thanks, Walter. I think you reiterated what, what, what really most folks uh, highlighted here, that the lack of capacity, um, there's, and um, the, the problem with, with uh, funding and support here, um, where and how that funding happens was not um, agreed upon by everyone here, but many of us. Um, I, I do wanna pivot to Sean um, and ask him some questions because um, I, I think that the wildlife refuges uh, have been in place for a really long time now. Um, and the, the, the really the key issues that we're talking about around wildlife disturbance and the presence of people um, 
is managed and there must be some sort of a metrical thing there that they decide when do we close this area off um, or when not um, and how how do we measure or how does U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service measure um, these sort of disturbances within these areas and sort of account for um, or manage the public, so to speak, or your education programs? Um, can you give us any guidance on that? Just kind of the long vision and any, are there metrics or other things um, around disturbance that help guide your, your work and your management of these areas? Sure. Um, so Oregon, let's see, Three Arch Rocks became a national wildlife refuge in 1907 um, because of, let's see, um, Finley and Bullman, some conservationists were out there and they observed locals target practicing uh, on seabirds and marine mammals and they thought oh this place needs to be protected so they went to president roosevelt and said hey let's um let's make this a national wildlife refuge and and they did that um so 1907 and oregon islands the rest of the islands. Uh, let's see, 1854 Rocks Research Islands are part of the Oregon Islands National Wildlife Refuge, and that was established, I believe, in 1936. Um, so, uh, as part of a National Wildlife Refuge, these lands uh, get special protection. Um, they are also listed as wilderness areas, which part of the definition of a wilderness area is to be untrammeled by man. Um, and so all of the islands, offshore islands that are part of the refuge are restricted uh, to public access. No one is allowed on those islands unless through, uh, you know, if there's a survey being conducted or a special scientific study, uh, then we issue a special use permit and allow people on there. But uh, very few people are, are on there. Now, as far as um, disturbance to seabird colonies and marine mammals, um, well, like I said in the chat, much of the disturbance is associated with predators. Um, as Walter mentioned about the failure at Yaquina Head, um, you know, the Yaquina Head has thousands of visitors at that site every year, hundreds of thousands, I'm sure. I, I don't know, I don't know the, know the numbers. Bureau of Land Management would have those numbers, but uh, there's observation points right at the, at Yaquina Head, close to the seabird colonies, and those thousands and thousands of visitors, uh, they don't seem to affect um, the murres and the cormorants that are nesting at Yaquina Head. It's the predators that cause the problems. Uh, they come in and they and the flush the birds off of their eggs and chicks and then the gulls come in and and eat the chicks and eggs and um and then we have poor productivity um now regarding uh you know like dog uh issues uh things like that now impacts to species like black oyster catchers uh are much more uh, a problem with, uh, you know, human disturbance and dog disturbance because they nest right on the shore. But um, seabirds that nest on, on the surface, on the islands and rocks or in burrows are less affected by people. Um, and uh, we do have a program, uh, Don Harris is in charge of our visitor services uh, and she could 
we could provide numbers of visitors to um, to the different refuges. Uh, we could get numbers out there, and and um, but we we don't really uh, document human disturbance except for uh, we unfortunately we have a problem with uh, coast guard uh, as they fly their missions over the seabird colonies, uh, those helicopters tend to flush the birds. Uh, and, and we totally understand the need for um, operations to protect the public and search and rescue and all of that. Uh, human life is, is um, priority over, over the seabird disturbance. Um, and so when they're conducting a search and rescue, you know, there's nothing that can be done there. But when, as they're flying their, uh, you know, uh, a reconnaissance mission or just doing flights, um, we get reports and, and we have to uh, go to the Coast Guard and train them and make them aware of the seabird resources and the marine mammal resources that are out there. And, and we uh, help them understand that, uh, you know, those helicopters do cause disturbance. Um, now, as far as unmanned aircraft like drones, um, those disturbances, uh, uh, drone use is increasing along the coast. And uh, with my experience, uh, unmanned aircraft does not disturb the seabirds uh, to a huge extent. Um, I've flown um, unmanned aircraft uh, 30 feet above uh, a goal colony and, and the goals, you know, they, they didn't care. Um, we also have flown um, aircraft, unmanned aircraft over cormorant colonies and mer colonies uh, at within uh, between 30 to 100 feet above the colonies and the birds, they stay on their nests. Uh, it's things like uh, um, fireworks that causes a disturbance. We did a study, uh, I'm sorry if I'm going on here, but uh, we did a study at Depot Bay a few years back with fire firework disturbance and we documented uh, cormorant nest loss because of the sounds and the lights from the fireworks. So those type of disturbances uh, are documented and are a problem. Um, I don't know. I hope that answered your question, Charlie, or yeah. anybody else. Yeah, that was more more than enough. And maybe I might just have a couple more follow-ups because I want to make sure I heard everything right there and that we're... Um, uh, what I heard from you was that you, you really don't document human disturbance unless it's a special case. Um, and you do have sort of number of visitors that you could get at from your, but maybe not necessarily a documentation of indicators or metrics around disturbance, unless specially asked. Um, you did touch on Coast Guard, which we're not going to touch with a 10 foot pole. Um, or 100 or 500 foot pole for that matter. Um, drones, uh, it's interesting what you, you, you highlighted here, particularly given a lot of the concern that we heard from the public and others about drones. Um, and then you touched on, on fireworks. Is, is fireworks the only sort of, you know, specific study like that that you think you've done here on the Oregon coast with respect to these disturbances? Uh, yeah, fireworks, and then we've conducted several predator studies that cause disturbance. Sure, um, but as far as human-related, uh, the, the fireworks is what you've been limited to? That's correct. Okay. Um, thank you. I, I think what I was trying to get at is, is the, the, what, what, what might be some of these indicators that would have been tracked by a natural resource agency that we might adopt um that that might help um with with future you know non-regulatory or regulatory management recommendations uh in the rocky habitat
uh, Dave mentioned in the chat, and this kind of gets at some of the things <laughs> that, that OPAC might con consider for continuing consultation, um, was that there was a study years ago of vessel disturbance at Three Arts Rocks. And um, Dave, I don't know how close you were to that, the evolution of the Three Arch Rocks sort of management plan there, but I do think that that's a helpful, uh, I, re I reread it and I reread their process. And I do think it's a really helpful kind of example of where you can zero in on site specific recommendations. Um, around uh, known metrics uh, that are that for a specific site. Um, and it's, it's a little different than the statewide stuff, but I'm just curious if you might uh, see if there's anything from that or share anything from that that might be helpful in the context of thinking statewide. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, so, so just briefly, the, the evolution of it is really came from the first Rocky Shores process. Um, there was a kind of growing concern um, about uh, uh, Three Arch Rocks, you know, being a, a, a huge, you know, nesting colony for, for several species and a, you know, big haul out and pupping area uh, for, for pinnipeds. And there was concern because that's, that's kind of a crowded area. There's lots of vessel use, there's lots of fishing there, it's, you know, big reef where, where fishing occurs, brown fish. Um, and there was there was concern of boats, you know, uh, the, the rocks are, I guess, pretty easy to navigate really close to. They're very vertical as they go down to the water. So so vessels can get within touching distance almost. And and also one of the rocks has a big arch in it um, that even some vessels would drive through the arch um, at times. And and so there was concern about the you know, kind of flushing of the nesting birds and other disturbances from that. Um, but it was similar to exactly what we're talking about now. There was a general concern out there, but there was no data. Um, and so uh, what that did is it spurred really our agency um, to develop a, a kind of a study to try to document whether or not there was disturbance. If so, what are the numbers of disturbances? And more specifically, you know, what, what are the details of that? Like how close could a vessel get without disturbing seabirds? Um, and, and so we set up a study, uh, we had uh, a per, you know, mostly one person, but um, who basically, you know, sat up on a bluff with, with, with a spotting scope for days, weeks, um, and made observations. We also had the Coast Guard involved. They, they uh, uh, brought their vessels out and, and, and positioned them in different, different distances from the rock so that the observer could get a uh, uh, kind of a metric for, you know, when is about 500 feet, when is about 1,000 feet, when is about 2,000 feet, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and, you know, after, uh, I don't remember how long it took, but, you know, a couple months, um, you know, they developed a pretty good documentation of, you know, the, the, the you know, really close uh, uh, passages or, or, or operations of vessels were, were disturbing the nesting birds. And that's where the uh, regu regulation was developed out of that, that put a seasonal 500-foot um, buffer around the main, ro the main rocks where, there's, uh, where the nesting colonies are. Um, so that's a good, good model. I mean, it's kind of a perception that was the disturbance. And then, you know, a study was developed to gather data on that and, you know, verify whether or not that perception was true. And then if, if so, you know, what, what are the details of that? And then... A direct regulation in this case, you know, developed out of that. Um, so it, it's a good model, but it's it's a model that's hard to apply statewide. It, it works really well with like one small targeted area, and you could you know set aside the the money and the staff to do that. But but to do that extensively along the coast would would be difficult. Um, and so there, ha you know there's never going to be the dollars available to do that everywhere. And, and so you either choose one or two priority spots to do that. Um, and hopefully, you know, get grants or get some, some sort of dollars to, to do it, you know, or you develop something different, you know, something maybe that's a lower level of data collection, like a citizen science type thing. Uh, but even, um, even citizen science, you know, a lot of people throw out the term citizen science is like some easy and free thing to do. It's not, it's, it's extremely difficult. It's probably more difficult to design a legitimate 
citizen science program that is to, to develop a legitimate, you know, kind of hard science program. Um, and it costs, it does, it's not free. Volunteers aren't free, you know, especially an intensive program. You, you need a lot of paid people to, to keep it going and, and to actually make it work. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, that's it. If there's any questions about the, the three arch rocks process, so. I'll be glad I to do. ask. I do. I'm just, just as a model and maybe if it's site specific, um, it, timeline, cost, engagement, what was the lift on that? Um, and it might be helpful for us just to say, if that's a good model, this is what it would take if somebody was to execute that in any given place ever again. Yeah, it, it uh, I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. It, it was probably uh, a, a person's time for, for six months, you know, counting the data work up and everything, um, you know, would be maybe a good estimate. Um, it also it also requires a location where you have to build, uh, you know, a nice clear site and pretty close site to be able to make those observations. There's a lot of you know, offshore rocks where you, you couldn't make those kinds of observations just because you, you don't have a good line of sight to them. So you'd have to do the observations from like a boat or, or aircraft, which of course increases the cost quite a bit. Yeah, and I think as far as, you know, applying it as the prescription um, is one thing, but saying that it's a tool that's out there that's, that could be applied if the right stars aligned or whatever is another thing. And so, um, I hear you. This is obviously not something that could happen statewide and is um, very site specific for all the reasons that you raised, um, observe, you know, observation wise and otherwise. Um, but as we, I think, think through this strategy and, the, and as OPAC maybe thinks through this, um, it'll be helpful for them to have, um, you know, uh, tools that, that do point to metrics and reports and other things that, that would make them comfortable, because um, I don't think that these concerns for certain sites will go away. In fact, they'll probably just increase over time and we'll have to deal with them. Um, how we deal with them is the question. And so I think this is the how, and it, it maybe in certain circumstances in the future. Mac Reef or Mac Arch is another site like that. And, and so I'd like to hear from Dave, because Dave runs tours there all the time, does fishing around that area, spends a lot of time in there. How do you feel about the the w the process behind that, um, and, and and as just as a user now, um, how does how do you feel about that? Uh, it meeting the goals or the needs. Uh, well, I wouldn't say I do a lot of tours there. Um, you know, it's less than it's probably somewhere between eight and fifteen times that I'm in there every summer, so it's not like a ton. Um, but I'm not really sure what you're trying to get at, like what that sort of survey might provide there, like they did at Three Arch. Well, I guess I, my question would be the problems that we're all talking about, right, that, that, we, that, that these are supposed to be solutions for, um, is the problem, the, the perceived problem, I'll say, at, at Mac Arch, has it been solved by the management prescription and the process that was behind it? And I might ask the same question for three arch. Um, I don't know. I don't think I know enough about the area, but when I, whenever I go there, there's no one there pretty much. Um, the couple of times I've been there, I've seen um, researchers come down, like when they were doing, when they used to do the trapping for the raccoons that were getting out of there and messing with the leeches storm petrels. And, and apparently they stopped trapping there. Um, they, that happened one time. So I know that the, the researchers are, go out there and like Sean said, they do sometimes create a disturbance themselves. But uh, like the Mac Reef area, I just don't feel like it gets so much attention right now that there's a lot of disturbance happening. Um, but I think that would be a spot that you could do some, some of this survey work because you could see most of the rocks from land if you had a good spotting scope and you could probably get vessels to go do what the Coast Guard did at Three Arch Rocks, you know, some volunteer boats out there and see what sort of disturbance might happen. But I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. I'm sorry, Charlie. No, I think you are. I think it's a different circumstance. I think that, um, you know, as you mentioned, um, 
Mac Arch is not doesn't have the the heavy use, um, and so you might not be seeing the impact, or it may not even be real there at this point. Um, maybe that's a better question for Three Arch. Um, do you feel like the work that you went through, the development of the metrics, the documentation, um, the creation of the buffers, and everything else, did it did it result in improved natural resources, or did did it you know quote unquote start to be solve the problem? So uh, I would kind of defer to Sean about, uh, you know, his, uh, um, uh, you know, looking at the colonies there, have, how have the colonies done in the last, you know, 20 years on, on Three Arch? Well, the colonies uh, have fluctuated dramatically at Three Arch Rocks. Uh, when I first got here in, in 2007, when we conducted our aerial survey, there were um, there were hundreds of thousands of mers and cormorants on the rocks, uh, and then a few years later, uh, it was basically void of nesting seabirds, and that 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 happened for uh you know several years but it wasn't because there was there was or was not a buffer in place to keep the traffic the boat traffic out it was because of bald eagles uh because the bald eagles would be on the islands and and they were scaring the birds off and um and now uh, the the past few years uh the birds have returned and um, you know, it's just natural fluctuations in, in the bird population. Now at Tillamook Rock, we were running into the same problem. Uh, years ago, there were hundreds of nesting birds there and many uh, sea lions hauled out on the rock. Um, and currently, there are no nesting seabirds there, um, and it, it's not because of human disturbance. Um, other factors come into play there. Thanks, Sean. So it's it, from your perspective, then it was it's pretty inconclusive whether or not the management actions around three arch rocks uh, resulted in uh, um, the, the, the benefits uh, or, or, or solving any problems. And it's, it's just a little bit more complex than that, it sounds like, with predators and otherwise. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. It's, it's, we, we really didn't, uh, even though we put the, the buffers were in place, um, we, I, I don't know of any tracking that was done to see uh, you know, what those management actions did. Um, I, I don't know. And then uh, the note from Dave about the storm petrels on Saddle Rock at Crook Point. Um, yeah, they, there, there were, oh, I believe uh, close to 100,000 storm petrels nesting on Saddle Rock, which is accessible at low tide. Uh, from the mainland, you can walk right out to it. Uh, and a, a few years back, um, there were basically zero birds nesting at Saddle, and um, and still there there currently are only a few hundred birds there. But um, those, those bird populations they seem to have transferred to a, a near shore a nearby island north. Crook Point Island uh, because the population have increased in, in those islands. Uh, but I, I do, predator control efforts have been implemented there, trying to um, control the predators and um, yeah, ongoing, ongoing research at that site will help us better understand um, predator disturbance, uh, human disturbance, et cetera. So this discussion has raised 
something we haven't talked about, which is predator disturbance, um, which is a huge and changing issue on the Oregon coast. Um, you went ahead, that nest failure was pretty unprecedented, I feel like, um, over the past number of years, both from bald eagles and that peregrine falcon, who's uh, taken up residence there every year. Um, but I'm hearing this repeated over and over again now, raccoons down at Saddle Rock. I'm hearing predator control from Sean now. I don't know what that means necessarily, probably trapping or eliminating predators. Um, so maybe, maybe it's worthwhile for us to pivot just for a moment um, and talk about that. There's people and then there's also changing predators that are impacting these areas. And it's important that we talk about this because we don't wanna conflate the two things. Um, one, one's a lot easier to control maybe than the other. Um, and it's one's probably more popular or less popular than the other in managing. So uh, I think I saw Walter's hand go up first. Um, and uh, before we pivot to that discussion on, on predator control stuff, I maybe um, Walter had something to share prior on the prior conversation. No, no, I just kind of to wrap it up, Charlie. Um, I, you know, I just want to thank Sean, you know, I, I I'll be sure and put in a good word for you with with uh, with Rebecca. You know, this information that we brought to everybody, this is this would be something that if there in, in another forum would, would would be good to get out to people. Um, and my only point here is that just because people see a problem and then they want to make a decision based on what they're seeing right now, that might not be the actual cause of the problem they want to stop. And it just goes back to be careful what you wish for when you're when, when you want to make rules and you want to start in, enforcing things and and and, and trying to address a problem you're seeing now. Um, I, I've seen a lot of policy decisions made and a lot of rules made on a knee jerk re response, and those never come out good because you have unintended consequences. So to me, this is a good ex example of be careful what you wish for and make sure you make the right decision. It might not be what you want to have happen at that time, but it, but in the end, um, you, you need to make sure that what you're doing and what you're you want to prevent from happening is what you're making the rule for. So that thanks Charlie and thanks Sean, and uh, thank thanks Walter. And I did did I, I Dave put something in the comments that was actually really helpful for me. I mean, if we're looking at it, trying to get at metrics and indicators. Um, on management actions, just, he just highlighted the challenge in that for things that are as um, variable as uh, nesting populations of seabirds uh, or shorebirds. So Dave. Yeah, just real quick here. Um, these offshore islands are probably these disturbances are from local recreational boaters, not so much from the average tourist who's walking on the beach and affecting the places like where we got these proposals. And so I think there's a big difference here between what we're talking about these offshore rocks and and then a place that the average joe can walk onto the beach um so i, I mean it seems like two completely different situations when the average bumbling tourist can impact on accident most of the time i would imagine um than the boaters so thanks good distinction um Dave. So where do we want to pivot to as a group? I feel like we've had a good conversation about some of the kind of consensus of our group that there's been several issues that we've heard consistently. Um, yeah, I think, I don't think that this group is ready to make recommendations around the prescription for these problems. Um, I think that what I've heard is that we all have different ideas, varied ideas, but we all recognize sort of three primary areas. And I, I want to gain consensus on that. Um, and if, if not, then, then we can revisit some of this. Um, 
that, that may need to be addressed in the future or thought more thoughtfully applied in, in the strategy. One, there's a lack of education um, that goes both ways uh, for um, uh, rules that, that and, and, and laws and, and other things that exist, um, but also rules and laws that don't necessarily exist. Um, there's a lack of capacity to, to implement um, those, those sort of expectations of the strategy, whether that be from state agencies or volunteer groups or the public. Um, there's um, a problem with, with wildlife disturbance um, that is both human and predator related. Um, and that, that those, those problems um, are hard to track, uh, particularly for populations like seabirds and otherwise that are um, you know, uh, highly impacted um, or highly variable, I should say. Um, I feel like that was the area where we all agreed and that I heard the most agreement. And that's what I want to focus on um, rather than maybe divergent solutions right now. Um, and I don't know that we're in a position right now to maybe make um, solution uh, recommendations. Um, uh, I, I think that there's a lot of approaches to this. We put some of them up on this slide right here um, as ways to get there. Um, but I, I do think that we will, we could revisit and spin around these issues forever without making any true recommendations. Um, and so um, it, it, maybe it is up to OPAC um, to decide what and how um, these, these uh, solutions um, would be met for these problems, um, or, or if there's solutions for these problems, um, in some cases there, there may not be. Um, I think that, there, that we can do better for all of these problems, and, and I, I, I would encourage any the small discussion on that. Um, and so I see Tom's hands up, and then after that, I think we could probably pivot to some public comment here. Um, I don't know that we have a ton more here today that we can do. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. Um, go ahead, Tom. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah, Charlie, good job. I think that's a great way to sort of create the big overview. The only thing I would sort of insert in there somehow are these sort of themes that cut across those issues. And uh, the, to me, I hear three. One is Andy pointed this out, which is uh, the need for uh, data-driven decisions in all of these areas. And I think that kind of thread, that's a thread that runs through all the discussions. And then the theme of coordination and communication. So I think those are, they, those can be captured automatically, but I'd like, I think it's good to sort of notice that those themes ran, ran through all of the issues that we identified as sort of major overarching issues. But yeah, I think that, and I agree that we're sort of there at this point. So thanks everybody, good job. Thanks, Tom. And I, I think uh, I, I wholly agree. Um, I'm a data um, driven decision maker as well. I, I do want to highlight, you know, what was in the chat um, as one of our biggest issues here with wildlife disturbance that we keep hearing is that there are challenges with creating data driven decision making around management solutions for that. And that has to do a lot with the highly variable nature of the, the animals that we're talking about. Um, so, which seems to be primarily birds and um, mammals. Uh, there's a lot wrapped up in the intertidal area that we've heard from as well. And I don't want to be um, dismissive of that by any means, but I do feel the primary concerns of the entire strategy and, and that of uh, many of these, uh, likely why a lot of this was established in the first place, um, was that these were resident areas for um, federally controlled species. Uh, and it gave us a, um, well, it gave us uh, a play in um, the Reaganomics of offshore oil. That's how this all happened in the first place uh, and why we're doing this now. So um, I will, um, at this point, uh, if folks are comfortable, um, open this up for public comment. I, would, I do want to make sure that if there's any dissent on any of those sort of key areas with education, capacity, um, and uh, the theme of the disturbances 
Um, if, if that is, uh, if, we, if, we, if there's any more dissent on that, I, wanna, I would like to hear it so that we capture it. Uh, if not, I'd like to shift to public comment. Yes, and, and um, Sean is highlighting things that um, came to be after the Rocky Habitat strategy was created, but also afford those protections. Um, many things have come into place uh, since the, the, the origin of this strategy and are important to recognize for sure. Um, so let's stop not hearing anything else from the working group. Um, and we can go to public comment. And if you're interested in providing public comment, you could put in the chat. Yeah, Joe already said so. Um, Joe, you're first out of the gate. All right. Um, everybody hear me? Yes. Thanks, everybody, uh, for the chance to provide public comment. Again, my name is Joe Liebzeit with Portland Audubon. Um, first off, I'll just say uh, I agree kind of with Charlie's summary of the issues you guys covered and where you're going with it in general, I would say yes, wildlife disturbance has been a big cross-cutting issue with the proposals. One thing that I didn't hear mentioned um, was the kelp loss issue. And I think that cut across a lot of proposals as well. So I think it's important to include that. And I think that that's something, you know, the kelp issue right now is, is um, really big. And, you know, earlier, a few years ago, we had the sea star wasting. So I think there are going to be issues like that that pop up as we, you know, have a warming climate and those issues emerge. So that's just something to be aware of that these kind of issues will pop up and will need to be addressed. And I think that's one thing about the strategy that could be really, um, if we can get that support um, and have a like Rocky Coast coordinator, um, that could be a, um, something that they could tackle quickly. Um, I would also say that regarding the kelp thing is that, you know, that's why subtitle was so important to include in the strategy uh, in terms of ecological, ecological connectivity. And, uh, you know, yesterday, I, I think I heard with regard to the Cape Lookout proposal, we heard, I think someone, maybe it was Scott say it was like mission creep, you know, including subtitle. But I, I would just, you know, push back a little and say that you guys all in the work group agreed to include subtitle habitat. So you threw it out there for all the proposers. So uh, we jumped on that and um, we included that because it's not mission creep, it's part of the process. It's in the Rocky Habitat strategy. Um, secondly, I do agree uh, that education of the public is, is huge. Um, and that I, you know, Dave's point about the complexity of the regulations and different agencies involved and how the site, every, different sites on the coast have different regulations is, is hard for the public. So I, I totally embrace educating the public more in that. I, I would say that the public is, be careful about treating the public as a monolith. There are folks that do understand. Um, and I would argue that there are probably some folks in the work group that don't understand all the regs either. Um, so I think it goes across uh, both the public and, and even, even to some of the decision makers of the understanding is just so hard. Um, I totally support um, this exploration of more capacity for agencies um, and, for, and for stewardship groups as well. And I think a coordination um, of increased agency support and stewardship is, is a way to go. And I don't think it's either or, I think it's both. Um, both agency support and stewardship groups to work together. And I guess that goes towards balancing regulations and non-regulation stewardship. I, I don't think, again, I don't think that's an either or thing. I think there are sometimes it's totally legitimate to increase regulations in certain places or certain times. But I also really strongly feel that stewardship is, is huge and it can go a lot more further than just signage um, and, um, uh, helping educate the public on, on disturbance to, and in particular to wildlife disturbance. And there's actually a new study by National Audubon that I think we included in the E. coli and Chapman proposals, a citation for that, that just talks about how they have found that stewardship programs uh, at sites where there are stewardship programs, you have much better protection of wildlife than at sites you don't. Um, so there's, um, actual uh, empirical proof of that. Um, and then getting to that whole data-driven discussion stuff that I think Scott brought up and like, where, where is the data? Um, 
I would say, first of all, in terms of like visitor, visitorship to the coast, we, we know it's, it's pretty clear that when you look at parks data and other data sets out there, that visitorship to the coast has increased dramatically in certain places, particularly on the North Coast in recent years. There's just, there's just no question about that. And the data's there. Um, speaking about oyster catchers in particular, which is a species that I monitor, um, you know, I, I, first off, I want to say I agree totally with David Fox that, you know, running a successful community science program is, um, it's difficult and it takes a lot to coordinate volunteers and it does, it does take money. Um, and I think we've put together a very strong oyster catcher project with excellent quality. Uh, we recently published a study on a population estimate of oyster catchers in Oregon and actually Sean Stevenson is a co-author on that publication. And we found that the population is pretty small in Oregon. It's probably five or 600 birds. Um, and in terms of human disturbance, um, there is data out there and I can provide this. Um, we did a North Central and South Coast comparison. And we find that we found that uh, of human disturbance on oyster catchers in particular, we found that when our nest monitors go out, but between 50 and 75% of the time they go out on the North Coast, they see people and or people and dogs within 50 meters of active nests. So right there, there's a metric for you, Scott. We found that more than 30% of, of nests on the North Coast had temporary nest abandonment when, they, when people approached. And there's a lot of literature out there uh, in, the science, in the scientific literature indicating that when birds are continually flushed from a nest, you have two kind of a double whammy that happens. You have adult birds, their, their corticosteroid levels or stress levels increase. And so their survivorship could be lower over time. You also get lower nest survivorship because as the bird is off the nest a lot, you don't have them incubating and um, you, you, they, the nest may, the eggs may not hatch for that reason, or you can have this predator issue. And so the predator issue is more complicated than just predation versus nest than, than human disturbance. Cause you can have a human disturbance, the birds flush off, off a nest and then predators come in and take the nest. So that's, a, that's more complicated. It's, it's th than just one or the other. Um, and that happens frequently. And, and that also is well supported in many different studies in the literature or that is seen. Um, we did hear yesterday, you know, from uh, Margaret's presentation that there, I think she said uh, at the Chapman and Ecola sites, there were seven nests monitored by our monitors up there. Only one was successful. Um, and, you know, the thing about monitoring nests and trying to know exactly the nest fate, it gets tricky um, because our monitors go out every few days at most, sometimes weekly. And so, in order to be at the nest when it, uh, the predation event or when the nest, uh, the human disturbance happens is, is, uh, and the nest fails is often not possible. But what you need to do is look for the correlation of, there are a lot of people at these sites, these birds are getting disturbed and then you have nest failure. So um, sometimes you're not gonna have perfect data but you gotta go with what, is, what you're seeing at the site. Um, I also want to say in terms of empirical data, we do know that nests of oyster catchers are more successful in offshore islands than versus on the mainland nests. And that is likely due to the fact that humans can't get out there. And that kind of supports what Sean was saying with seabird nests that are off on islands, they're, they're not going to have humans disturbing them on islands because humans can't get out there. Uh, and it's true, bald eagle populations have increased and so there is increasing um, uh, um, predation for, for that reason as well. So, um, but I guess the take home here is that um, there, you're never going to have perfect data, right? Um, and I would encourage more support for groups like us and for agencies to do more of this type of monitoring so we can get those metrics. But without that, I think you need to go with a precautionary approach. And that is in, in your strategy. Uh, when there's data lacking or not enough of it, um, protection of key areas um, should take precedent, precedence and it can still be done with balancing human access in lots of areas. Um, but we do know that nests are failing for oyster catchers um, and we do that at those situations. There's often a lot of people and pets around. So um, in certain places, in certain situations, and I think the, uh, a lot of the proposals um, that you saw yesterday um, uh, highlighted that 
in those cases, we want to have a balance of human access and protection. And um, I guess uh, what I would love to see is when the proposers are go through that con continuing consultation process that the work group or whoever evaluates them at that time, whether it's just the agencies circle back and really think about the stewardship um, efforts and how that can really help, even if there isn't um, support right now for a stewardship program. I think these are long term um, proposals and we need to think in the bigger picture. So I, I know that it's great when you have Shoreland Education Awareness at Coquille Point that ha or have an existing program that's been there for years. That's awesome to support a site like that. But we also need to support sites where we may not have as much support right year, right now in 2021, but we could in a few years. I'll stop there, thank you. Thanks, Thanks Joe. Um, do we have anybody else that would like to provide public comment? If so, please put those in the chat. Okay, seeing see none, um, we will uh, continue this discussion just a little bit longer. I, I saw Scott's hand went up uh, right before uh, I was I was I went to public comment. So I think he had a question for Dave. Um, looks like Dave has his hand up as well, and maybe Joe raised a few points there um, that folks would like to talk about. Um, I think. Uh, he did point out the, the kelp um, theme, which we did not include in our sort of thematic overview. Um, and that obviously uh, was, was something that was highlighted throughout um, and we did not discuss today. Um, so I do wanna recognize that that was a, a, a key theme that we, we kept repeating and hearing. Um, the solutions we were, we were, were, were buried uh, on that, uh, nor were they um, founded. Uh, necessarily, but it sounded like Orca had some approaches. Um, nonetheless, um, let's start with Scott, then I think Dave, then I think Walter and Tom, is that right? I think Tom's hand was up before Walter, but- uh, uh, Scott, Dave, on... Tom, Walter. I was the last one. Whatever order is fine. Uh, it looks like Scott just stepped away. Um, Scott, are you there? Maybe Dave, Lacey, why don't you go ahead? Sure, yeah, I just wanted to encourage us to, to think big on this and it's just a recommendation to OPAC. It's why not think big, let's shoot for the stars and maybe we land on the moon, but there is a lot happening right now that I think could support this program with bills like the Oregon uh, Trails Fund that was created, the Great American Outdoors Act, some of this infrastructure work that Biden's proposing. Um, a lot of these things, really dovetail with what we want to get done right now. And there's also the economic development agencies that I think would be um, like the SCDC and the Small Business Administration. They, they're always looking to create jobs um, in this situation, I think lends itself to that. Um, and the tourism agencies are already talking about this. So ACFA and Travel Oregon, we've, we've looked at multiple ways that we can support the agencies and educate and folks before they even get here with our social media campaigns and, and marketing efforts. Um, and I also think parks has a great host program that they already use to uh, staff their parks. And why couldn't we um, provide free camping or, or yurt stays for more of these interpretive rangers? Cause I know there's a big housing problem with finding staff in, in a lot of situations. So that's one possible solution. Of course, we wanna include the NGOs and all of this. And then there's one example I wanted to highlight um, down here in Curry County, we have a partnership with tourism agencies, the sheriff's department, um, state parks to, to have this aquatic safety officer who goes throughout the county and educates people. And he's especially targeting safety. Um, and so he'll go out and interact with folks at high tides with big swell events. And a lot of the people are just standing there looking back at shore and the waves are almost coming up and taking them out. So there's a big safety issue here that I think um, could be incorporated in all of this. And, and honestly, I think we need three positions. I don't think one's going to do it. I think a North, Central, and South um, to, to coordinate all these efforts um, would make a lot more sense than just one. So creating jobs is what I really wanted to 
kind of focus on here while doing some of this work that we want to have done to protect our resources. So that's kind of a, a lot in one little state or big statement here, but that's all I want to say. Thanks, Dave. I'm gonna go back to Scott. I think he uh, was in line first here and stepped away. Scott? Yeah, I just had a question for, uh, maybe Dave can answer this. Uh, we, we've seen in these proposals, I think uh, Cape Bowweather had a good video showing the number of the vast number of urchins that apparently are um, creating um, loss of kelp. Why, why do we not see uh, the urchin divers harvesting those? Is there a market issue? Is there a regulatory issue? Uh, it seems like uh, we used to have less of an issue with that. Uh, and there used to be a pretty robust urchin fishery. Why, what, what are the reasons that we don't see that right now? So, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good question, Scott. And it, it's, so what, what we're seeing, what we're seeing now is really in kind of an unprecedented explosion of the specifically the purple sea urchin population. Um, and, you know, the, the, there's a lot of kind of complex interacting things going on, but but the simple answer concerning a fishery is when you have an explosion like that, you basically the animals are starved. There's they basically eat out what food is there, and then when there's no food left, they're in a starved state. So when you harvest a sea urchin, you know you sell the what 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 gets sold is the is the gonads basically. It's the uni. Um, you know, that, that uh, is, is eaten. And uh, urchin needs to be well fed to have uh, kind of marketable uni. And so what you have with these purple urchins, um, if you break them open, there's hardly anything there. Um, so there's really nothing marketable in, in these animals. And the main fishery has actually been on the red urchins, which have a, a, a they're bigger, you know, they have this bigger product, basically more in, more in demand. And the fact that these purple urchins have exploded in population, not only in numbers, but they've actually expanded their depth range. And it, it, you know, in the past, the, the red urchins were mostly a deeper water animal and the purple urchins were mostly intertidal or very shallow subtidal. And what's happened is their population has expanded out to the deep, deeper waters. And when I say deeper here, you know, it's not super deep. It's, it's uh, you, you know, 50 to 100 feet, you know, that, that type of depth. Um, and, and so what's happened is the red urchins are also starved. Um, so the main market product is also starved in most areas and isn't marketable. And the one exception really on the Oregon coast is Rogue Reef. And for some, for some reason, um, Rogue Reef has uh, kind of maintained its kelp bed. Um, I suspect that the purple urchin population didn't really increase as much there. And so really what's left of the, of the urchin fishery right now is folks that go out, you know, some of the fishermen that go out of Rogue Reef and harvest that product. And that really, in the last couple of years, that's been a huge percentage of the whole West Coast product of red sea urchins have, have come from Rogue Reef. Um, so that's kind of where the, you know, the fishery is now. Um, and it, it, it's really, you know, it's going to take the, the situation where that population has to decrease, you know, to allow the food source, which is mostly kelp or, you know, other, other algae to recover and uh, eventually someday <laughs> have these red urchin populations, you know, become well fed again and uh, um, uh, increase, you know, to the point where they could be fished again. One, one thing that's uh, a really unusual phenomenon with, with urchins is they could live in a starved state for a very long time, years actually. Um, and um, so it takes, you, it, you know, in a normal situation, if you have a population explosion and the animals starve, eventually that population kind of dies back and everything recovers. The problem with red urchins is that, or sorry, with purple urchins is that could be, uh, you know, many, many years before that kind of die off happens and the, and the recovery happens. Sorry, I probably went to more detail than I needed to, but well, thanks, Scott, it's, it's, did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you, Dave. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That, that was very educational on a number of, of levels. The, the zombie urchin thing, I had no idea that they could live in a, a sort of suspended state there without eating for a long time. And uh, yeah, the, the size of the gonads equates to the amount of greens that they eat. 
Um, so uh, Tom was, was an urchin diver for many years and I'm sure has a lot to say about this. I think who's next in line? I, I believe it was Dick. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say thanks to Joe for uh, bringing up some really good points here in the in the public comment. Really appreciate that. And specifically, I wanted to uh, capitalize on the climate change issues he brought up. I mean, he talked about kelp. Of course, that's been brought up in a number of the sites that we looked at. Um, climate change, of course, is going to be it is hitting currently squarely on rocky habitats on our coast and having dramatic impacts. Um, we go from one species to the next, it seems like. Um, Directly or indirectly, these and we're losing. Sometimes we lose keystone species. I mean, in the course of two years, we saw like 90% of our uh, sea stars disappear, and then they, of course, have crept back. Some of them, now the other ones, uh, sunflower stars, which are subtitle critters, have not come back at all. So there's still, still a lot of impacts that are occurring regarding um, climate change directly on our rocky habitats, having direct impacts to the to the. Uh, health of these areas. And the one thing I wanted to bring up that we haven't talked about very much, we've talked about it in some of our meetings previously, was restoration. <clears throat> and the fact that there is some potential to do restoration in rocky habitats. Um, there are people who are um, restoring uh, canopy kelp in places, being done more in, in uh, Scandinavia, as I understand, but other places looking at um, growing kelp, they call it kelp gravel. So they're seeding it into, into rocky, into rocks and then transplanting that. So people are beginning to be innovative at looking at ways to do this work. Um, this again is work that uh, is often coming through academia at first. And then of course, uh, working through agencies and other things it takes a lot of coordination, but um, it's certainly well worth doing. Um, people are also talking about uh, restoring abalone populations in places. Um, that should get people excited who are thinking of fisheries because of course abalone um, can be and uh, certainly a very rewarding fishery for those who are taking part in it, even though it's more of a money maker to the South. So uh, I think there's just a lot of things like that that um, also will um, come to play in our near shore in our uh, rocky habitats down the road. And I think we just have to be adaptive and ready for these things and in ways that um, are gonna be coming at us more quickly than they were in the past. And so I'm glad that we're setting ourselves up for being a little more nimble here in rocky habitats down the road. And it's probably will be something that's gonna require all hands on deck as we go forward. So I just wanted to, again, thanks Joe for at least uh, reminding us of some of these issues. That's it for me. Thanks, Dick. Tom. Yeah, I guess I'll bring it in, bring it on home here. <laughs> I don't have to repeat a lot of things that I was going to say have just been said. And thanks, Scott, for your question. Uh, I'll add a couple of details to Dave's uh, Dave Fox's pretty thorough explanation. Uh, one is that the Orford Reef was the center and major producer for the commercial red urchin fishery uh, back when I was urchin diving. It has not produced marketable urchin in several years now. I'm still in pretty tight contact with my former urchin dive buddies. And in my opinion, uh, they really deserve the credit for bringing a lot, of, a lot of this issue, a lot of this kelp forest issue came to our attention uh, at least five years ago. And it was from them because they're down there in that habitat spending a lot of time, hours and hours and hours, seeing what's going on. And unfortunately, uh, you know, they were howling in the wind for a few years. But more recently, we've convened the Oregon Kelp Alliance because of that. And now we're all at the table together having these conversations and rolling out projects like the one we're doing right now to start getting better data at multiple sites to, to do exactly what Dick just said. And I wanna emphasize the notion of restoration. I think it's time to talk about active conservation in some of these areas. And there are many techniques. Uh, this project is just one. We are talking about active restoration at some point. Um, the green gravel approach is one. Uh, there are several grants out right now from NOAA to do some innovative work around moorings and uh, dealing with minimizing whale entanglement while you also do restoration work for kelp forest habitat. I wanna make a point here about our, our terminology. We use the term rocky habitat a lot, obviously. 
uh, and because of our history, there's a tendency to equate that with kelp forest habitat, which is very rich, highly diverse, productive, uh, many commercial species depend on it, etc. But in a lot of places, kelp, uh, rocky habitat that was uh, previously assumed to be kelp forest habitat is becoming not kelp forest habitat. And I think that's a, that's a major issue. And we're having these conversations right now with commercial fishermen who are partnering with us on some of these projects because they're starting to see the, the loss of the, basically the nursery for a lot of commercial species. And so I think it's, it's just gonna become more and more important um, there, we've, we've been sort of struggling through the messaging on this uh, because it's been, oh, it's a California problem. We're not seeing it in Oregon. Well, I'm telling you, we've been seeing it in Oregon for years here on the South Coast. It hasn't gone away. And is it patchy? Yes. It's, uh, this is part of the complexity of the messaging. My windsurfing buddies down uh, at Rocky Point are complaining because they've never seen so much kelp and it's getting in the way of our, my windsurfing vibe. Um, but right around the corner from here at Nellie's Cove, it's a desert. And I, Dave can tell you this too. And we both fish that area um, a lot. And uh, it's not what it was. And it hasn't been for years. So we, uh, I, I just guess want to thank Joe for sort of refocusing our minds a little bit. Uh, I've been a little bit, you know, I guess kelp forest for the trees because I've had my head down on this for a long time but it is definitely a recurring theme. Uh, it's occurring in multiple locations uh, and the uh, Oregon Kelp Alliance is uh, also exploring other projects like uh, advancing some uh, increased monitoring. Uh, that's another big problem. We haven't monitored our kelp forests in Oregon since 2011. Okay, that's 10 years without monitoring this while these major changes have been happening. That, that should be unacceptable for this group and for the state because uh, it's such an important part of our rocky habitat. And if it goes away, a lot goes with it. So I'll, I'll just stop, I'll get off the soapbox there, but I do think those are key issues. Um, I do think it's a theme. I think it needs, it needs attention and it's getting attention and uh, we should support that uh, the development of that capacity as well. And I'll stop there, there's much more, but I'll be sharing more information with you guys as it comes out. Thanks, Tom. I, I appreciate that perspective and, 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 and all your work with kelp, your focused work with kelp and the habitat. Um, it, it's largely important to um, a number of issues. Uh, fisheries is, is critical for um, the nursery. I mean, I would highlight that, you know, we used to regularly once a year do a pilgrimage to Cape Lookout. We'd camp out and surf overnight and go out and spearfish that kelp habitat, and you don't do that anymore. Um, there, there's really no spearfishing to be had there. You, you might look out on a rockfish out on the end of the tip um, there, but uh, otherwise, it, the, 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 what used to be there is no longer there. Um, I would also oh, yeah. highlight the um, cyclical nature of changes. Uh, and um, when we did public scoping, this was not something that came out. Um, and I just, I'm highlighting that not because this isn't a problem, but because it's a problem now. And if you look back to the public scoping and you look at the top three things that were a problem for the Rocky Habitats, in the top three was marine debris um, and disease. And the reason that those two were part of the top three was that tsunami debris was happening and a thing. Um, and sea star wasting was happening and a thing. Now, I'm not, I'm not dismissive of either one of those issues, um, and I'm not dismissive of kelp. But what this tells me and what it should inform the strategy is that um, we will experience many different types of stressors um, in the rocky habitat and in the ocean, and they will be changing and different. Um, and the management you know, needs that, and the recommendations that we make 
um, should be where we can um, comprehensive uh, and supportive of a lot of different types of things. Um, uh, had we made decisions about how to manage the rocky habitat solely based on disease or tsunami debris, um, we might have different outcomes today. So I think it's important, um, you know, that hind casting this issue and saying, um, we have a lot of things influencing rocky habitat, some of them very specific uh, that we might have targeted strategies around to work on in a moment of time or, or through a period of time, some that may become consistently problems forever. Um, and we probably need to distinguish between those. Um, so I just wanted to say, mention this, not because I'm being dismissive of, of the kelp issue. I, I fully believe that's a major issue. Um, I believe we'll see more. Um, and it won't be kelp, it'll be something else. It'll be warmer oceans. It'll be a loss of a certain fish species or that. Um, and so I think it, it's important for us when we think about how we make recommendations um, to do our best to think in the broadest um, context of how we can support the ecosystem um, and support all users. Um, and I, 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 I will appreciate uh, folks in, in, in OPAC particularly thinking through those sorts of things when we um, when we come up with recommendations uh, for the future. Um, is there any more to be had on this, this particular discussion points or that a public comment? If not, um, I'd just like to maybe one, invite everyone to the OPAC meeting. Um, I think your presence uh, for some of you is required for, for others, um, it's not required. And I hate to drag you along even further, but I really think it's important that the entire working group, if possible, um, could be in some way, shape or form present. Um, uh, there may be questions from OPAC. Um, you yourself may wanna give testimony um, on this. Mm -hmm. um, so I am, I'm encouraging you to participate in the OPAC meeting. Um, we will, uh, it will really be up to me and, um, uh, Andy and uh, Moses, and I'm going to um, call to Walter here as well um, to sort of put together uh, how we're going to present this to OPAC. And um, while in the past that's really relied uh, on me and representing the working group and, and, and Moses and Andy, um, I do think it's important because we have big decision points here um, that Walter, you're in, involved in, in, in how we put this together how we present it to OPAC and, and essentially how we're gonna um, uh, queue up sort of decision points for them. Um, ultimately, I think what will happen out of this is that we, we will have a large recommendation that is you know, voluminous um, and, and one could really read through and dig into um, and interpret, but we will, we will have some pretty precise um, motions to, for consideration or otherwise that we need to develop based on um, what has come out of the proposals um, and, and, and also out of these discussions. And so um, for that, um, I, I do think it's important that you guys are present if you can be to, to ensure that consistency of the working group. Um, and and for, for the for this, what's left right now in our in our meeting and our time, I, I want to um, go back to the working group and see if there's any concerns um, or you have any thoughts and and on that um, as as Walter uh, Moses and Andy and I look over the next couple of weeks to pulling this information together. We are just on over 17 days, I think, away from the OPAC meeting, which means we're putting ourselves pretty close into public meeting notice. Um, so we will have to notice this, um, specifics of the agenda and everything else. And that might help give you an idea of when to be present. So you don't have to attend the entire OPAC meeting um, if you would not like to. Um, so I'll stop there and see if there's any thoughts or feedback on any of that. Just a hey. quick question in terms of the procedures. So uh, how, what is it, what's the, What's the, sorry, how's the process gonna work if working group members want to give te testimony at OPAC? That would be a part of public comment. That would be a part of a public comment. However, you know, it, it is the purview of 
myself, Moses, and and Andy um, to take your feedback. If you would like to be um, uh, provided the opportunity for comment um, following a presentation uh, or separately of that of public comment, I, I'd have to look back at Andy and say if that's if, is that okay. Um, I, from OPAC procedure wise, I would think it was okay. Um, it might be nice to distinguish the working group from that of um, you know the the public who's who's kind of been um, ongoing in this process uh, for decision making points. Would that be appropriate, Andy? The executive committee could make a decision to allow uh, time for that, but I I can't make that decision on my own. I'm okay. curious curious as to Walter's thoughts on it, but uh, I think Whatever that. So yeah. I, I will err on the side of caution and Tom, if you would provide those in, in writing, because we have other um, subjects at the meeting that we're going to need to take care of and uh, yeah. make sure that, and I would welcome all comments from the, uh, all of the working group members. Um, and not that I don't want to have you speak at OPAC, but uh, we, we are going to be um, time limited on that. I think we have five hours budgeted for the meeting. And uh, this is one of the, the main topics, but it isn't the only topic we're gonna have on there. Yeah, understood. <clears throat> understood. Uh, to be honest, I think just this, the conversation we've just been having is what I'd like to speak to. And maybe it's sort of a combination of being on the working group and also working with the Oregon Kelp Alliance on a lot of these issues. And I think there's ways to be concise and provide good information and don't wanna hijack the process in any way. Thanks, thanks, Tom. There's, um, uh, and I'm going to shift to Dick here, but I do want to touch before we hop off to on um, minority reporting um, from the working group as well, uh, which is part of our process. So, Dick. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask Ariel about what the what materials are going to be presented to OPAC, um, and if we can see some of these ahead of time. Um, I realize that they're voluminous, as you noted, and some of the stuff we've seen ourselves a couple of times, whether they're full proposals or even our own responses and, and drafts back to the proposals that the proposers that Michael Moses and everyone pulled together here recently. But if there's some summary documents that are being um, promoted, it'd be great for us to be able to see those at least a day before the meeting. And maybe an easy way that it just even in a week's time, maybe just a really coarse outline of, I always think about things in outlines, like, hey, we're gonna talk about these three bullets, these things and present these materials. That may give us an idea of what's going to be given. And then if you get down to the day before and you have, here's the summary document that we're going to give is four pages. Um, that'd be great. And I don't expect to see PowerPoint because I always do those the night before. So I totally understand that that's going to be last minute. But um, anything that is, is available without sending us the whole darn documents that all this stuff that I know is going to be there, that'd be appreciated if we just have a little bit of time to read over them beforehand. So we could, if we see any error or comment, we could make that to you all. Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I, it's going to be tight. We literally have three days between the two week notice for OPAC and, and that may be over the weekend. So I recognize if we give you something that you in turn change, we have to give that to OPAC two weeks ahead of time so that they can review it. So we're going to, we're doing the best we can on that. I think I haven't after our meeting last night and since this morning come up with the summary. Um, so we don't have anything to share with you right now. I expect that Moses uh, will work on that over the weekend probably, uh, and we'll try and get that up and out to the working group next week. Um, but uh, yes, is the short answer. I'll just tell you, it's challenging to, to get it all perfect. We will be, um, uh, you know, if we don't do public process right, we will be undercut by the public on that. Um, and, and that's why it's really important that I make sure that we get our timing right and we get everything right. If we miss it by a day, it, 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 it could prevent us from presenting anything to OPAC. So, um, but yes, I think is the short answer to your question. Just to know that there's a lot of, uh, a little levers and things around this with respect to the, 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 the process itself. Um, 
that being said, I do want to just go back quickly to the outcome, the probably the biggest outcome that you know of this process and in the, the voting around the proposals um, that that may seem straightforward um, right now will not seem straightforward at OPAC, um, and um, I, that's probably the stuff that you're gonna you're gonna need to look at um, and pay the most attention to. Um, like you said, there's volumes of opinion about how we should manage all the problems. There's concrete decision points around designations and how those are treated. And I think those are probably some of the key things that we're gonna hone in on. Our process this summer will allow us and afford us a little bit of time to come up with those more narrative recommendations around the process that obviously nobody's happy with. Um, so we'll do the best we can. That'll be after this, this OPAC meeting. Um, the, the point I do want to talk about just for a moment um, is that we had dissenting opinion on a number of our votes. We had, I think, five consensus votes in total, maybe. Um, Moses, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe it was six. I have to look here and count them up. Um, regardless, there is a number of consensus votes um, that are pretty easy uh, to, to to say that's everybody thought this. Um, the non-consensus ones, the ones that went to a vote um, and then had a declining vote from a number of individuals in different cases, um, I would like for there to be some documentation around that minority. Um, that is something that we do at OPAC. I think that's probably an expectation of OPAC. Um, I, I, I think that uh, we had both state agencies and other representatives here that um, voted no on certain proposals. And in those circumstances, I do think it's important that we have a good sort of minority opinion documented um, for OPAC. Um, it's, 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 it's our job to sort of carry the outcomes and, and that is an outcome of the process. So um, I want to maybe pivot to, to those um, involved in that, um, that, that. Would you like to put, put that into a narrative form? Um, how, would, how would you guys, or how do you guys feel like we should document that um, uh, minority opinion? Laurel? I don't have an answer for your specific question, but I'm wondering, well, some of the minority opinions about were about whether or not it should go to continuing consultation, right? So is there a difference or would you like to see one report for both? Um, I Maybe think pulling up the spreadsheet. there was a no vote in the proposal process, um, whether continuing consultation or not, it should come with that minority opinion. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. I get, I'm not sure I'm yeah. clear on the question or, or, or others help me out here because I'm not quite sure I, I'm understanding. I just there, there's different pots. So there's the there were no's on whether it should move. Like the first decision was should it move forward, and then the second decision was if it's not going to move forward right now, should it go into the the middle pot? So it just make the minority report clear on when all those decisions, you know, when there was a no and and the reason behind it in the report, I guess. Uh, it's hard for me to see without seeing what the outcome was because I didn't take a screenshot or write it all down. Yeah, and and I, I, I apologize. I, I anticipated this problem today. Um, and so <laughs> looks like we have that in front of us. I, I This could get really complicated. So I'm going to try and not let it get complicated right and, now. And let's uh, also keep in mind, if we if we want to document every time there was a dissent or minority opinion, then, then that's a lot of write up to do on top of all the other things that we need to prepare. Um, it is, um, and and but what's in, I think what's important is the outcome. So not every dissenting, but there where the outcome of the recommendation had a dissenting opinion, right? The continuing consultation had a dissenting opinion. 
all the other stuff, I think it's up to the narrative of the working group in their own words, whether they want to share that otherwise to bring that forward. Um, and I think that we can, we do what we can in documenting that. But I, th I think that it is, we are making, you know, a recommendation to out to uh, an outcome, a recommendation to OPAC. Some people did not agree with that. And that we need to document. And I do believe that that needs to be, I, I, I need to make sure that the people that had dissenting opinions and had the minority opinion, are, are their, their concerns are carried forward. That's just a, it's an OPAC process. Um, and, and, uh, and, and I think it's important. Charlie, can I make a suggestion? Um, since I was on some of the dissenting opinions, sure. uh, Frank asked the people who said no, that they had to say why they said no. And I think most of the time, those people that voted no did. And that's part of the record. And if that, honestly, I didn't write down everything I said, um, but it is there for the record. Is there a way that that can be compiled and then sent to us? Because we, we went over a, do a dozen proposals yesterday and, and a lot was said. And putting the onus on us, when we were asked to get, state our no, on the record and we did it's it's kind of tough for us to re remember what we said without writing it down verbatim sure i i guess would you be willing at the at the end of the day it, it we have to communicate that um and that means i have to communicate what you said um and all those things so i want to make sure that if it's me or if it's moses that's doing that um that those opinions are represented correctly um, I would hate to go and then find out at OPAC um, that they weren't documented correctly. That's that's kind of what I'm getting at. Um, and may, maybe, you know, since you were a dissenting vote on on some of these, if, if your help in sort of how we package this and put this together um, would be helpful. Um, but I do want to recognize that there were there were a number of others at times who had um, dissenting votes as well. And I, I just, I'm trying to figure out how I best capture those without, you know, forcing OPAC to watch the deliberation or trying to fully write out the narrative, which I don't think OPAC will read. Yeah, one of the things we can do is ask Frank for his notes. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure about the quality of those. And the other thing we can do is provide the video as the record of the meeting. I understand where you're where you're come from, Charlie. I think the complexity of having all of the documented minority opinions on each of the sites is um, and, and getting those materials to OPAC is is going to be a significant challenge. So let's uh, Andy, can I, yep. I, I, yeah, and like I said, I don't want to complicate this. And as far as, you know, I, I will also say that we had half a dozen or so other OPAC members on board on, on the call yesterday, and I'm not going to put the onus on them. Um, I, I think that the mind, our, 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 our comments are there on the record, and they, and they were put there. And I understand Charlie's wanting to get that out in front of OPAC, but I, I don't see a, a simple solution to this other than you or Michael going back and listening to the, the six out eight, eight hours of, of conversation and trying to decipher what everybody said. Um, so yeah, go to Frank's notes. I'll, I'll look about back and I, I didn't detail everything I, I wrote, but I'll, I, I can I can do a gist of it and get and get that to you, but otherwise I, I don't see a, a simple solution to this. And I appreciate Charlie's effort to be transparent as possible on this. Yeah, I mean it's not just about transparency. I mean it's, it's good process when when the outcome does not favor that of others. I mean it's it's really important that they felt heard and that their dissent is clearly documented, particularly if we're not the ones making the decision. Um, so that's, that's, that will come back to bite us, um, 
uh, over and over again, if, if not. So I, that's, that's all why I'm, I'm kind of, we'll figure this out. Um, and, and, I, and I hope that folks can uh, know that we'll do the best we can here. I, I don't want to be evasive of that. And that's what's really important. I mean, Dave points out the timeline here that we're up against in the, um, in, in, in the chat. So it's, it's complex. Laurel? Oh, I was just trying to see if any, I think most of our dissenting was whether or not it was needing to go to continuing consultation, if I'm looking at the spreadsheet correctly. So um, I'd be happy to put together, a, you know, a summary of those cases. I don't know if I can do it by Monday. I, I think I could, I could potentially do that too, based on what I heard. I just don't want to assume that. Um, so I, I, I can look at the voting and see some consistency around continuing consultation. I think that has to do with what continuing consultation means um, or the lack of understanding of what that means. Um, but I'm not gonna project that on anybody. Um, I wanna you know, kind of, but we'll figure out a way to best summarize this. You guys will see it um, again, uh, as Dick mentioned. Um, and we're going to try and make this, um, again, you think about all the decision points we've made in this process and how difficult they've been. Uh, OPAC has a limited amount of time to make a few decisions. And so we're going to have to really boil this down to a handful of things. But I want to be honest and I want to be respectful of our process and the process of OPAC. And a lot of the comments that I remember are in the chat also. I mean, a lot of them were in the chat or not all of them, but there are a good amount of them were in the chat. And so there's, there is some written documentation there. Okay, any, Laurel? So I don't know if um, Moses can sort of help clarify this spreadsheet in the final product, because if this is going to OPAC, it's, it's a little confusing. Like it's got the result, like the, the, the vote for consensus first there's multiple then, tabs this, this is problematic yeah, okay so it doesn't have the whole thing as far as whether this or not, not presentation this is just reference right i mean i'm just having a hard time would be <laughs> much more clear and straightforward and we'll probably okay. have the recommendation votes first because that's most important and then a sec separate table with consultation votes is what i was thinking yeah, because you've got like not recommended by consensus, but then when it went to a yeah, vote. I put this together vote. last night with, on request. Yeah, so it will be helpful if just, yeah. We're going to need to it, it needs do to be some clean, work yeah. to, to clean it up and make it much more um, understandable. At and I would ask that if you've looked at this or you've taken a picture or a screenshot of this, that you are considerate about how you share that because there's information, this, there's, this can be misleading um, and, and, and how it's presented and how it's interpreted. So please, I, I ask that, that you give us the time to, to work on how this is going to be shared um, we will provide that to you before we provide that to anybody else. Um, but um, I just ask that, that for now, let us, let us work through how this is um, the, the result and, and how it should be displayed and shared. Um, because I do think that there's a lot in this spreadsheet that one could really quickly react to. And I don't, I don't want to see that happen. And I know, Laurel, you even looking at it are, are starting to see those things. So. Well, yeah, I mean, the one that looks like it, you know, is being recommended, we're the upland land manager for it. So I think for that one, particularly, I think it would be important to the, for OPAC to hear our perspective since the working group decided something contrary to what we want for that particular proposal. And that's, that's kind of the areas that I want to hear from you back on and make sure that we get them clearly documented and communicated. So that's helpful. Uh, you're muted, Charlie. Anything else for the for the good of the order here? Um, we did. Uh, I don't see tribal nations online, but since we had opened this up for public comment prior, I want to be respectful of our process that also opens it up for tribal nations comment. 
We have, we have two attendees and n neither of them are tribal representatives. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. This will be the first meeting that we're going to end early. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're going to stop early. Uh, there's the, no need to continue pivoting around these discussions. Uh, I cannot thank you enough. Um, I can't thank myself enough either. <laughs> uh, this has been a long process. You guys have been extremely valuable. You will continue to be valuable as we work through this. My expectation um, of the working group, uh, it's really OPAC's expectation of the working group that may change at the next OPAC meeting, but I would hope that following this recommendation to OPAC, um, there may be some workshops this, this summer, which we would all participate in um, to help shape shape the feedback for the ongoing process that we need to sort of develop um, or make recommendations around. Uh, and I, I, I'd rather than us, you know, holding meetings after meetings after meetings, I, I would like that to be, um, we get together and have workshop it. And we hear from those who are on the evaluation end, um, but we also give another separate opportunity for those in the public and the proposer end um, to give us their feedback. There may be a third workshop where we get together, um, but, but I do think it's important to kind of hear those um, separately and uh, kind, of, kind of work through some of the things separately. I think it would be great to do those in, in one or half day or even less workshops um, rather than lots and lots of meetings. So um, that's my, uh, uh, my vision for, for this working group and where our work concludes. Um, and uh, if I, 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 there was some mention of permanence in the chat and at one point about this working group, um, I think if this working group was to become permanent, then that's something that OPAC can direct. They're gonna need a new chair though. Um, I'll tell you that, because I'm gonna have to step down as chair um, after this next OPAC meeting. Um, I'm happy to continue participating in this process. Um, I've carried this as far as I can. <laughs> Um, and I, I, I am growing weary um, and I am tired and I don't think I can be a good leader beyond getting us to a recommendation for OPAC. Um, so I, I'll just say that I, I will be stepping down as chair at the next OPAC meeting um, and I'll be happy to play whatever sort of leadership role is possible. <laughs> it's a life after Rocky Habitat working group. I've heard it <laughs> referred to as the Rocky Horror <laughs> working group before. Um, I, I've heard lots of apologies there. Uh, <laughs> Good um, one. Well, thanks, thanks, Charlie. Yeah, for, thank you. Thank for your you. Your leadership. Uh, it's been a rough road, but we got here, and uh, in large part, thanks to you and Moses and Andy and everybody. Really, I'm, I really appreciate everybody. So much work has gone into this. Yeah, and, and let us not forget Deanna, um, who was prior to Moses. Yeah, the OG. <laughs> sat in that seat for two years um, and really wrestled through a lot of big, big questions at the very beginning of this process. Um, and so we've, we've, we've come a long ways. Um, and I, I really, really sincerely appreciate everybody's time, particularly given the trauma of the past year and a half on everyone. <laughs> uh, we'll get over it. Well, and for a future vision, I'd love to get everyone out together um, on a rocky shores or around a campfire on a beach. Uh, yes, let's let's yes. barbecue some tuna or whatever. Um, you know, when this freaking pandemic is over and everyone's got their shots, we, we can hopefully do that. So um, as long as you I, bring your guitar, Andy, uh, I'm there. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. I really wish that we had been able to do the Rocky Habitat tour. And I yeah. think people time is really important. Um, and uh, yeah, having a few drinks on the beach and a bonfire um, is sounds fantastic to me. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that. All thank right, you. everyone. Let's make sure we end this meeting early. Yep. Absolutely. Meeting adjourned. Thanks, everyone. See ya. Have a good weekend. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Bye.